Hello everyone, hello everybody. Uh, I'm really proud to be here in Barcelona and thanks to the Barcelona Jug for having me here. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, before the presentation begins, uh, I've been asked to remind you that if you like this presentation, you have to signal it either on the device close to the door or on the application. And if you don't like it, you can do it as well. So, in this presentation, we are going to talk about HP benchmarking and what, uh, as a team, we learned uh, when doing those. Okay. Uh, so, this is, this is a blog post that was written by uh, a company called Tech Emperor uh, in 2013. And this blog post makes a comparison of uh, about uh, 20 web frameworks written in different languages. So it's not only about Java, it's also about anything. So you can see Go, Ruby, and of course Java. And the goal of this, this, this benchmark is uh, to compare, of course, raw performances of, of such frameworks and, and runtimes, stacks. And why? Because often when you have to make a choice and choose a stack for your application, uh, then Performance is certainly one of the factors that is important. We have all heard about stories about, you know, uh, applications being rewritten in different language because it couldn't scale. Or also it's important because uh, about user experience. Most users will expect that a web page loads in less than two seconds. And uh, after three seconds, usually they give up. What is really interesting about this, uh, this, this benchmark is that it's, uh, it's, it's open source, it's open. So it means that anyone can contribute, it's available on GitHub, there is a mailing list, and you can contribute, so you can contribute uh, to add a new framework if you want, or you can improve or tune existing frameworks. Uh, today, the, this, this framework benchmark, it's uh, more than 400 frameworks and 26 languages. There are five tests. Among the five tests, there are two categories. The first category is, uh, you know, uh, benchmarks that don't use the backend. So it just, they just respond like a static string or JSON. And in this case, it really tests the HTTP server. It doesn't really test the application. And then there are three tests that test with the backend, so with a database like Postgre, Mongo, whatever. There are a set of requirements that you, one needs to follow. Requirements means you cannot, for instance, if you are in database, Benchmark, you cannot uh, cache things. You have to go to the database every time, and uh, so it makes a fair comparison, and it doesn't uh, benchmark. I mean, it benchmarks exactly what you expect it does. And those benchmarks are run regularly by Tech Emperor, and they publish runs. And there are two kinds of, uh, of runs. One is physical server, and uh, also they, make it, uh, they run it also in the cloud. What is also really interesting is that since one year, there is continuous benchmarking. So it means that uh, regularly, every day or every two days, the, all, the whole benchmark suite will run. And that's very interesting because when you maintain such, such framework, in Tech Emperor Framework Benchmark, uh, you can know directly what are the impacts of the change you have done. Like if you upgrade a version or if you tune uh, uh, something, you will, you will be able to know that. Uh, in this in this presentation, I will talk a bit about Vertex. Uh, so Vertex is a, a toolkit for building reactive applications in Java. Uh, mainly, what is important to know is that uh, with Vertex, everything is fully, fully event-driven. So it means that when your application interacts with the outer world, it will be using events. That means we will never block to get something. Like if you do an interaction with the database, you will not wait for the database to respond. You will get a notification, an event, when the database uh, rows, I mean, when the client will return a row from the database. It's pretty popular. Today, it's like 10k stars on GitHub. And uh, it's important to know that it's powered by Netty. Um, actually, one of the Netty, uh, the current Netty lead used to be a, a former Vertex contributor. And it comes as a stack, so it means that it's not only HTTP, but you have a stack for doing a lot of different things, like uh, interaction with database, of course, with NoSQL databases, and uh, Kafka, MQTT, a lot of things. Uh, in this presentation, of course, I will not talk about Vertex itself and how you write an application with Vertex. I will talk about what we did in Vertex to, to, to improve the performance of the in, in the Tech Emperor Framework benchmark. If you want to know more about it, you can, of course, uh, go on the website, you have plenty of documentations. 
which are really great, and a lot of examples. And you can also buy this book in, uh, in MAP that is, uh, that is coming this year. So how did Vertex perform in Tech Emporer? Well, it depends. Uh, in 2013, you can see that Vertex was one of the best contenders, along with Nelly and a few others. And it was great. I mean, of course, uh, we weren't, Vertex was not first uh, by, uh, by pure hazard. It was because people uh, invested time to, to make sure that Vertex was fast and also that it was tuned to run in Tech Empower. However, after uh, the next year, or two years later, in round 14, uh, we can see that Vertex performances are, are, are not what they used to be. And in this case, we are talking about, you know, the only the the, the ah, sorry, we are talking about the benchmark that doesn't use a database. And if you use a database, then at round 14, Vertex was really not great. You can see like at place 42 or 43, you can see Vertex with PostgreSQL or Mongo. It's in one of the in one of the benchmarks. And in another benchmark, you can even see that Vertex did not complete. So it means that, well, what what happened? And actually, at this moment, we weren't, not, we weren't fully pay at, paying attention to, 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 to that. So people in the community, because it performance matters to people, uh, they start to, to wonder about why, why Vertex is doing that. So those are extracts from, the, from our mailing list. I didn't invent anything. Uh, so people say, OK, stars are not really good for Vertex. Is, really, is Vertex really good not with database, or is the benchmark wrong? So they were questioning a lot of questions about that. And uh, today I will talk to you about what we did in Vertex to, to, to improve that. Uh, I'm Julien Viet. I'm coming from Marseille in France. I've been contributing to open source uh, since 2003. I had the opportunity in 2003 to contribute to JBoss Application Server. And I had the great uh, opportunity to, to, to be hired at this moment to continue to work and uh, make a living of my passion. Uh, I'm also the Vertex project lead, and you can follow me on this uh, social media if you want. So before we start the benchmark, it's important to remind you of, uh, the other presentation. Be, it's important to remind you a few important things. We are going to talk about benchmarking and not about simulation. So it's really different from what you would expect from a load testing tool. Uh, most of the time, when you have a real application, you want to test it according to scenarios, like users are going to ramp. Uh, well, it really depends on the scenario. In case of benchmarking, we are here really to push hard the limits of the, of, 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 of the execution. Uh, measured on guess, it means, uh, well, when you do benchmark, you have this, uh, this cycle where you set expectations, uh, you define a baseline, so it means that you, okay, you can, that's my target, that's what I want to do. I measure the performance, I try to find uh, what is the current bottleneck, and then I measure again to see if there is improvement, and you continue like this all the time. Uh, in this presentation, we'll, we'll see a few tools um, that are used um, on a daily basis when we work on performances. Uh, so basically, we will, I will, it's, not, it's, it's not a, a talk about uh, flame graphs or of, of profiling, because those, this kind of tools requires really uh, to spend a long time on it, and uh, we, we don't have time, unfortunately. But basically, what is important is that you are going to use two tools. Uh, we'll not use them. Well, it depends. We'll use Async Profiler, which is a profiler written by the JVM, and also Perf and Details, which are tools to, to measure performance in, uh, on your system. In Java, there are many profilers, and uh, some of them are wrong. Uh, it depends. Uh, what is sure is that if you use those, Async Profiler and Perf Details, you will get uh, accurate results that you can trust. And actually, Async Profiler has been written by, uh, by Andrei Pengin, and he, there was a talk just before by, given by him at Barcelona uh, in the other room before, so maybe uh, you, you were in his, uh, in his presentation. We also use Flame Graphs. Flame Graphs is it's only a visualization tool, and uh, what is important here is that when we collect statistics, we do such things. Uh, what happens is that you have a lot of data and we need to be able to make sense of a lot of, of this data. And, and Flame Graphs is a great tool to figure out things. Uh, and the last tool we'll, we can use also is Gtwatch. Uh, Gtwatch is a tool that you can use when you know there are some things going in the JIT and you want to know to figure out the reality of things, you can use Gtwatch. And all of these are the tools we, we, we need. 
Uh, Flame Graphs, as I said, it's a visualization tool. It was created by Brendan Gregg at Netflix. Uh, it's, uh, well. So let's start first with the plain text benchmark. So in this uh, benchmark, it's a simple hello world. So the application really does nothing. It really sends hello worlds. Uh, and what is important it is, is that it uses HTTP pipelining. And I will explain later what it means. And the test takes between 200 and, OK, there's a typo, 56 connections, not 66, up to 6K connections. And you take all, you make benchmarks with all these connections, and you try to, f and, and then you retain what is the best, and what is the best will be the result in your benchmark. So it's really only the client and the server. And what is important to understand is that in this benchmark, we use HTTP pipelining. So pipelining is, uh, is a technique that is used to improve performances. Um, by default, HTTP is uh, what we say one request at a time. So when you do have a con one connection, you make a request, then you get a response, and then only at this time you can reuse this connection to make a request. So if you want to have more concurrency, more requests, one way to get more is to, to just open more connections. Uh, but another way to, to do it is just to, to send more requests on the same connection. Uh, the expectation is that we send some requests and uh, we don't wait for the response to come back uh, when, we, when we do this. So it, it allows to increase the concurrencies. In, and of course, the improvement really depends on the round trip time between the client and the server. And the largest it is, the more benefits you can get from, uh, from HTTP pipelining. It's not a silver bullet because uh, if there is a long process ti processing time on the server, uh, HTTP pipelining will not improve much performances. But if we, if we do have very short uh, computation, like Hello World, uh, then pipelining will, will do a lot more. Uh, so the first lesson we, we do have is that uh, it's batch writes appropriately. Uh, when we do, you do as a, as a server, um, writing the buffers to, to, to the OS uh, in the TCP stack is, is really important. And what is important is the time at, at which you do it. If you do it too often, uh, you will spend a lot of resources in the server. And if you don't do it often enough, then you will also have issues. Because if you don't send the response, uh, the client will not get the response, so it will not send a new request. So there's a good trade-off. And what is important here, so I will first use my first frame graph. So I do have, let's open this. Uh, so let me find the right one. Um, so that's, yes, yeah, so that's the flame graph. That is the flame graph we get uh, from, so yes, first, of course, I didn't introduce much about flame graphs, but basically, uh, what you can read here is, uh, is, it's a typical flame graph you can have, and basically it maps uh, Java stack traces. So here it's really the beginning of my application, so you can see uh, Java long thread run. And if you go, I will make it larger, I think we can do that, great. And the, the upper we go, the more of our, of our application we can see. And what is important to understand with frame graph is that on the X scale, we are not talking about time. We are more talking about uh, the larger cities on the X scale, the most cost there is associated with that. And in this case, in this example, that is a version of Vertex that will flush uh, the buffers every time the HTTP request response ends. So basically when the, the application say, okay, send this, uh, that's the response, it will send it at this moment. And we can see in this case that there is this write here. It takes, so it's not really visible for you, it takes almost half of the time of the, of the CPU to send buffers to, 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 the, to the network. And if you remember correctly, I told you that it's a pipeline benchmark. And as it's pipelined, it means that often we receive not only one single one request, one HTTP request in the, in the TCP buffers that are coming from the client, but we also we can, we can receive up to 16 uh, requests. So the optimization we do at this moment is that instead of, of writing data 
uh, for each request, we batch things. It means that we, we handle requests, we write the response, but as at this moment, we don't yet flush everything on the network, and we continue to, to, to process the requests, and we continue to write, so we accumulate this in memory, and fortunately, they are small. And when, it's, when, when we have finished trading, at this moment, we know that we have finished trading, so nothing, will, nothing more will, will, will come from the network. At this moment, we flush everything. And so if we take the same thing, now with, uh, is this one. That, so that's more or less similar flame graph, except now we can see that uh, our application spend much less time in, uh, in writing to the network. We can see that the write here takes only 16%, and that's really key to get great performances in this benchmark. If we are in the normal case uh, where we don't have pipelining, there will be no difference. But in this case, that plays a great difference. Uh, the second one is keep your method small to ease compilation inlining. So, uh, so the previous trick was about networking. This trick is, is about uh, how you can write better code uh, and how that will influence performances. Uh, when we committed stuff in, in Vertex, we, so we, we run the benchmarks often. We have a continuous integration for that. And uh, at some point, we did this commit. And uh, what is interesting is that when we did this commit, we noticed a 3% uh, performance decrease. Uh, that's what we measured, something between 3 and 5%. And if you look at the code, uh, it might not be meaningful, but if you look at it, it's, it really it, it handles a special case. So it means that when we run uh, the benchmark, actually the benchmark will never go in this section. So that's a, really a piece of code that uh, that's, I mean, it handles an exceptional case. So the question is, why would that influence my, uh, my application? Why does it degrade performances? And to understand that, what is important is to, to understand just-in-time compilation in the, in the JVM. Basically, just when you have the JVM, it will take the code of, that is currently executed. It will profile it. So look at what is uh, executed more often, gather statistics. And at some point, it will say, okay, this method, this, uh, this call, everything there, it's called very often. So I, what I will do is that it will take this code out of the interpreter, because that was running initially in the interpreter, which is really an interpreter of code, and we will compile it to, 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 to assembly code that runs uh, in, on the CPU. And all this choice will be, will be done using statistics, and it will also optimize only for the hard pass. And the kind of optimizations we have, it's like there are many, there are plenty of them. And one important is method, method inlining. Method inlining is that it, it means it will just take one method and, and copy it like you will do manually in the color in many places. Well, or in all the places at least that are hot. And why is it important? It's important, of course, because it saves the calls, so it saves a bit of CPU, but also method inlining is an enabler for other kinds of op optimizations. And if you look at the code you have seen before, here is a larger view of it. So it's a method called process message. And in this method, uh, well, you can't re really read it, right? Uh, but we don't care much. I mean, it's not really about each line of this code, of this method. It's the fact that it's very large. So if you look at what it does, is that this piece of code does a process error. So it takes really the exceptional case. So that's where we added code in the previous commit. It processes the request, which is what the JVM will really execute when our test is executed. And the last one is that it processes a body. So the first one, it processes request, it processes the beginning of the HTTP request, like I've received an HTTP request here with these headers. And the other, it processes body, it's only called when there is an HTTP body, like it's a put or a post. And so, when we look at this, and we look at the, the flame graphs we did from that, uh, one great thing we can do with flame graph is, so let's, I think it's this one, yes, should be this one. So this is a, a different kind of flame graph. It's still the same flame graph, but what's interesting in this flame graph is that the blue lines 
they are the colored, it's because it's, when it's blue, basically it means it's good, because it means that it's inlined. So everything is blue, it means it's inlined, and when it's green, it means there's a real method called. So thanks to, uh, I think I did that one with Perf and not with Async Profiler, and, and with that one we can see the code. And if you look at the code, we have the method what's called process message. So we can zoom in. So here we don't care much about the it take. In the previous example, it was really about reducing the usage. And in this example, it's about process message. And we can see that here. We have a do message received. Uh, so that's internal code of Vertex. We then it calls send all message. Then it calls process message. And we can see that there is no inlining here. And, and basically, in the, in the test we have, in, in what we did, uh, is that because we added some code uh, to the method, the method grew bigger, and it could not be in line anymore. So basically, the, the code we wrote at this level of performance created a regression. So what we would like to do is to, is to understand why this method was not in line. And spoiler alert, I told you it's because the method grew bigger. And to, to, okay, I don't know. Okay, it's because it's on another screen. To understand more, more of that, we can use one tool that is called JitWatch. Um, and basically, what we'll do with JitWatch is uh, look at, so let So I will just compile the, this. It's a small compilation, I think. I, I need it because I will use JitWatch, and we'll, JitWatch will try to find the source code of the application. Uh, and I think I did a small update. So I already have this log, so I will now run JitWatch. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a Maven plugin. It's a two tools. So JitWatch, there are two tools. The first one is that you collect data. Um, when you run the JVM with a lot of specific um, uh, command line options. And then you can use the GUI, and then it creates a log. And in this case, what we'll do is use this, the vertex. So that was in vertex 342, this regression. So we use vertex 342. We give it the log, we start. And here we'll see, with JitWatch, it's really a great tool. It will tell you everything about the JIT. And if you remember correctly, what you are looking for, so we'll try to make it bigger. I think it's hard to make it bigger, uh, the, the font size, because it's, uh, it's JavaFX and I don't know how to do it. But basically what is interesting here is that we go in, so in the Vertex package, what we were looking at, and I think it was Vertex HTTP handler, uh, or server connection, it's handle message here. So by default, when you use JitWatch, what is really great and how I configured it is that for each method, it will show you the, the bytecode, but also if you have enabled it, it will show the assembly code that was generated by, uh, by the JVM at this moment. So if you know assembly, it's, uh, it's something great. But basically, that's not what I want to show you. I want to show you the compile chain. And here, what we get is, is what we have. So we have this handle message that you have just seen before. And remember, handle message was, calli was calling, calling some code. And then it was calling uh, the process message. And now if you look with JitWatch, uh, basically when it's green, it means it's cool, because it means it's, it, it, it's inlined. But when it's red, it means it's not inlined. Uh, and in this case, it gives you the reason why it's not inlined. And it, it says, indeed, it says that the method is, is too big. So it's because we added some code that the, met the, met the method size grew bigger, and it could, and of course, when the, the JVM does inlining, there are limitations, and one of the limitations is that if the method is too big, it will not inline it. There are other li limitations, like the depth, the stack depth, there are many limitations, but basically, in this case, that's what we do. That's what we have. So, go back to the presentation. So what we did in this case was simply that we, we, we did a simple refactor. So we, all the rare code that we were not supposed to execute was moved out in an handle error methods. 
uh, the same for handle content. And so we reduce, in this case, the method size to favor compilation inlining. So we help, basically, we help the JIT compiler uh, to, to make our code easier to inline and more performant. Here again, I, will, I need to say again that we are doing HTTP pipelining, and it, it really pushed the, 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 I mean the limits, not the limits, but we really pushed the benchmark it, 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 on the CPU. I mean, it, so that's why it makes a difference. Maybe that in, in non-pipelining, that will be different and that will less affect performances. But in this case, that plays an important role. But, and so let's continue. And so this part of the code, which is the code that is always uh, executed, we could, of course, uh, extract it and make it similarly in a handle request or handle headers message. But we don't do it. We just keep it here and we keep we inline it by hand. And there, there are two reasons we are doing that. The first one is we know that it will be executed all the time, so it will be always on the hot pass. So there is no need to do it. And maybe that if you will do it, maybe the JVM will not inline it because of another reason. So in that case, we are sure it's inlined. And the other reason is that um, if we don't inline it, we avoid one method call. And I, as I told you, uh, inlining has a limitation in method size. And one of the limitations is that if it's too, de too deep, it will not inline as well. So let's just save one stack. And since we are optimizing, let's just keep here. It will be a better thing. Uh, last one, um, so in this case, we, yes, uh, when you push the JVM hard, uh, it will create, uh, the, the application will create a garbage collector, and of course, when you create objects, what the JVM does have to do after, it has to, to reclaim everything. So all the objects you allocated, they will have to be reclaimed to be to, by the GC, and the more objects you create, um, the more you have to, we have to, to collect, of course. In, in normal situations, again, that's, that's maybe not a problem because you can tune the GC and everything. That's something you don't do in your application. But in case of benchmarking, um, well, everyone is pushing, is pushing the runtime very, very, I mean, their servers is optimizing their servers, so we need to do it to stay in competition and make, try to make a difference and, and, and be better. So how can we, can we do that? And in this case, we are, we are, we are interested also by, by, by looking at what is unnecessary. Like basically, everything that we allocate that is not necessary, it's unnecessary work. So let's just avoid to create this object and avoid to reclaim it after. So which tool do we use again for this? Async Profiler. So what is nice with Async Profiler is that you can profile different kind of things. You can profile CPU, which is what we did before. But you can also profile uh, met allocation. So when you run it, it's a very simple tool to use. You do, uh, you do profile this process, which is a Java process, and I, you, get, you give a switch with, I want to profile uh, object allocation. Uh, so in 3.4.2, that's one, so it's called frame graph alloc. I will open it again with Firefox. And here, what we get in this frame graph is the allocation. And the larger it is, the, the, more, the, the more allocation it means. So, in, so it's not all the allocations of the GM. It's really the, the most important ones, of course. So for instance, here we do have some, as I told you, Vertex uses Netty. Here we do have some Netty code that uh, will allocate a Karen string and that is used to create the GP headers that are decoded from the byte buffers that come from the network. Is that the allocation we can save? Uh, I don't think it's safe to do it because that's what the application will need. So that's a regular kind of allocation. So we can look at everything here. Uh, the frame graph gives plenty of uh, interesting things. But there is one that is here that we found that has a bit an exotic name. So if you look at it, it's uh, invoke static, get lambda, and then it calls io.vertex.core.net, .vertex handler, dollar, dollar, lambda, dollar 63. And is that something uh, interesting or not? It's, uh, when we looked at it, we, so we tried to understand what it is, and we see that it's called in vertex handler, channel read methods. So we looked at the code. 
and I will show you some code here. So basically, that's uh, an excerpt of, uh, of this code. So here, we, it's when we process a Netty message from the network. So when Netty creates an HTTP request, then we have to process it to, 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 to make it rooted in Vertex. And so it calls this code. And we call this method called execute from I.O. It's, uh, well, I, will, I won't give the details, but it's an important method because in Vertex it will, it will do some things around the application, like taking, making sure that everything runs correctly, that you don't block the event loop, that concurrency is, uh, is, is, is well done. But basically what is interesting here is that the allocation we have seen was the instantiation of this lambda. So this is a Java lambda. And when you do a lambda, uh, this lambda, it, it, it references this object here, message, okay? And as it has to do it, this lambda does not come from, from free. Every time we, 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 we need this lambda, we, inst we, we instantiate a new object. That's the, the idea. So what we did is that, if you look at it, what we need is that we, we, we just have a lambda that references a con.startread, which is a field of the object, so we don't capture here something. And then it calls handle message, con, and message, so it references this. So it, that's why the reason it, we need to, it, the JVM will instant, will instant an object is that it, it needs this. So every time we call, it creates an object, and this object wraps basically this object. So what we did is that we created a new method, uh, execute from IO, where we pass, because often when we execute from IO, we have to pass an object. The, that, uh, because execute from IO is like called every time the network is calling. So it can be process message, but it can be different things. So we added a new one, and in the signature we passed T, and now instead of having a runnable, we have a consumer of T. And now the code, when we execute it, we call execute from IO, we pass the message, and here we get the message, which is exactly the same message. We call it, and now we don't reference anymore. And, and if we do that, then the, the, the lambda will be non-capturing, and we'll have only one instance that will be created by the JVM, and it will be stateless, basically, at least in the context of this uh, object. And this object is a connection. So. And so if we look at it now in the flame graph, that's uh, the same allocation flame graph in 3.6, and, uh, well, if you, if you look for it in this flame graph, you will not find it anymore. All right. So let's recap. Uh, in this part, we have seen how to, to improve things. We have seen that minimize flushing is important, optimize for the JIT plays an important role, and of course, keeping the GC cool is a good idea. We, there are plenty of other optimizations we do have. Uh, I, I try to, to choose the, the most important ones and the, the ones which are the most relevant. And thanks to that, uh, in round 15, we have been able to, to, to improve Vertex performances. And now, I think at this moment, if you look on the website, we were at uh, rank 11. So what is important here is that to see that Vertex, wh where, where are we trying to go with Vertex? Are we trying to be first? And the question is no, we can't, because in this benchmark, the plain text, pipelining benchmark, it's not realistic. There are plenty of other runtimes which are more optimized which do less things, and that's important. Um, uh, when you do have a framework, if you, have, if you bring a lot of usability to, to your framework, it means you will have to create a lot of objects, do a lot of things. So the more usability you have, I mean, the more features you have, uh, and, 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 and the less likely you will, you will go up. So with Vertex, we try to find the best balance between usability and performance. And what is important for us is to look at Vertex and also at Nelly. So you can see that Nelly is a bit less performant in this benchmark. So it means basically that Vertex is, is performing the same than Nelly. And, and Vertex uses Nelly, so Vertex cannot really be faster than Nelly. It can be sometimes uh, because we, maybe we use things differently or we make some optimizations and we use it, I mean, we use it differently than the Nelly benchmark does use in Tech Empower but we'll be always roughly the same. So our goal today is not to be the first, but to be at the same level than Netty. And that's very important. So it means that for us, at least now, we have reached our, our uh, expectations. 
So now let's talk quickly about database benchmarks. So database benchmarks, there are four kinds of benchmarks, DB queries, fortunes, updates. Every benchmark does a different thing. DB is a simple query, like a simple select. Queries is the same thing, the same benchmark, but it executes it like up to 20 times the same query. Uh, fortunes, it's an insert and, uh, or an update, and update is an update. And when you do this benchmark, you have the choice of your database. So basically, you use MySQL, Postgre, or Mongo. And it's up to 256 connections. So it's not more. Maybe today it's 500. Maybe it changed recently, but it's, it's not a lot. And that is important. So at 114, what we found is that uh, JDBC plus Ikari CP, which is a connection pool, gives the best, was giving the best performance in Java. In Vertex, we are actually also using JDBC with a worker pool because we are doing things on event loop, we cannot block. And actually, in this benchmark, blocking is not an issue. Um, what I mean is that um, Vertex performance really shines when you scale to a lot of con concurrent connections. And in this case, this benchmark does not favor uh, things like non-blocking Vertex because there are only 256 concurrent requests. And can today a, run, uh, a runtime running on a 32 core CPU handle 256 connections with blocking to the database? Yes. And it, will it be faster than event loop? Yes, it will be faster because there are less. I mean, because that, that's the way it is, because uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> we don't push enough to, to make a difference. So what we did is that we That being said, we, yes, we decided to do something, so we decided to focus on Postgre because that was that, that's the fastest horse in the course, so choose the fastest horse to, to make the fastest course. And I showed you before some dramatic bad results, and actually those dramatic bad results were due to mistakes in the benchmark itself, like uh, in some benchmarks we did not create a transaction, and creating a transaction was optimizing a lot of writes and, and the, in the thing, so that's why it was so dramatic in... Uh, In Vertex. And so what we did is that uh, we really want to, to, to understand why uh, it was slower and, um, and, and, I mean, and, and what, what we could do. So we decided to start to write a PostgreQL client in Java with uh, simple goals, like the goal is just to be a client and not to be a driver. Uh, so it's not uh, something low level, it's more a client. Uh, It's non-blocking, performance, and lightweight, everything. Um, and it doesn't try to be an abstraction. So we don't try to make a client for every kind of database. We just handle Postgre. And also Postgre has uh, specific features, which are great, so we can use them. And what is important to know with Postgre is that if you look at the, and that is important, look at the protocol uh, between, uh, the JDB, between the client of the database and the database, It works like, you know, a query response thing. It's like it's GP. Uh, sometimes, so you, you, you make a query, you get a result. You make a query, you get a result. And here's the idea we had is that uh, if HTTP pipelining is so performant, why don't we try to apply it to, to Postgre? And basically, that's what we, we did. Uh, we tried to, we said, okay, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's pipeline to Postgre and see if it gives better results. And, and the outcome is that, yes, indeed, it gives much better result. Uh, so pipelining, as I, as I said, is, is, is a way to improve performances. For instance, if you use Redis, Redis, all the client Redis also do pipelining. So it's not uh, something we invented. It's just that we, we, we saw that you can do it with pipelining with, with Redis or with HTTP. Let's, let's try with Postgre and, uh, and, and see if it gives best results. So that's uh, a small benchmark I wrote. Basically, this benchmark executes 5,000 5, queries. And the blue is JDBC blocking, and the green is the pipelining uh, uh, Postgre client. And so on, on the, on the y-axis, you have the times it takes, and on the x-axis, you have the number of pipelining. So one means we execute one query, and we wait for the result. Two, it means we pipeline up to two queries, and 16 means we pipeline up to two, uh, 16 queries to the database. And we can see that uh, at 100 microseconds, pipelining until four really makes a difference in terms of performance. Then eight, 16, it doesn't pipelining, uh, increasing pipelining 
doesn't in increase much. And what is important, that's something I said before, what is important here is that uh, pipelining allows you to save the round trip time to the database. And it only works if the processing time on the database side is very quick, which is the case in the benchmark. So what happens if we increase the 100 microsecond time, which is a very good uh, round trip time for a database to something that can be more usual, especially in the cloud where there, there is more latency between nodes. If, you up, if, you, if we improve, I mean, if we upgrade it, if we raise it to one milliseconds, then we can see that pipelining makes again an even larger difference. And that's um, what it gives. So in our case, thanks to pipelining, at 115, Vertex was able to be the, the most performant. Um, uh, with this client, we were able to be the most performant uh, uh, database benchmark, which is great. And it was uh, really surprising to us. We didn't think that pipelining could make that much of a difference. If you look at the continuous integration uh, results um, that I told you before at the beginning, and, and we restrict the, the benchmarks to only Java, you can see that uh, basically if you look at from, so you can see popular names, you know, like uh, Ratpack, so of course there is Vertex, Green Lightning, it's, it's not popular, I don't know exactly what it is, Vertex Postgre is the second. Uh, there is even Micronotes, Spring Webflow Client. Uh, so here, spoiler alert, I need to say that uh, Spring Webflow Client is not done by Pivotal, it's done by uh, other people. So it, so that, I think that's fair to say it. But basically here, if you look at the seven first, under the hood, all are using the, the reactive Postgre Client to achieve the same results. So basically, thanks to increasing concurrency and improving, improving things, uh, we were so, I mean, it makes so much of a difference that uh, in Java, at least, other, other runtimes consider to use it, even if they don't use the vertex, to get uh, similar results. And that's what they get, basically. So, is, I mean, so we, we, we got this, those great results. And uh, uh, of course, on the Tech Empower Framework ben benchmark list, it's a Google group. You can go, people start to, um, to look at why, why is Vertex and Postgre so fast with Postgre? We want to understand. Basically, they are, they are, it's so fast that we can't even compete. So it, what, what are they doing? Because, of course, when you are the first, people are going to look at you. And so people start to look at it and uh, complain. So that's an email that was sent. And uh, basically, the idea that we do uh, pipelining might be a conflict with a requirement uh, from the test which says that you cannot batch things, you cannot do such things. So people said like, doesn't it conflict with the requirement that every results, that every query results in a full, full round trip to the server? So round trip means I, I, of course that I send and I receive. If I send several and I receive several in pipelining, is it the same, I mean, is it compatible or not? And that was last year actually, this. Uh, the guy said also it looks like a violation of the, of this, of the, of the requirement, but he said, okay, but uh, I like it, it's a cool feature. So <laughs> the guy was a bit positive, you know. So when I read this email, I say, you know, I told myself, okay, maybe we'll see what, what, what happens, but people find it's cool, so it's cool, at least for me. And of course, I, I, res I responded, I said, can you elaborate why it violates this requirement? Um, and then take on the guy doing Tech Emperor, uh, basically they said an email saying in summary, we are leaning toward prohibiting pipelining, but also they said, if there are more opinions, we'd like to hear them. So it means that initially they, they wanted to, to prohibit them, but they were open to, to, to hear more what people would have to do, could say about it. Uh, and finally, um, the get the tech compiler guy said, I believe this should be allowed. So that was a great thing, I think, for, for us. Like, uh, it was validating that our ID was interesting and was making a difference. And it was playing by the rules. And finally, they say, we, tech compiler, have decided to allow pipelining between the application and the database. And they said, we were clarified, which is what they did. And now, if you look at the rules, they say, whether it is permissible, to pipeline traffic between the application and database as a network level optimizations. It means you cannot do these optimizations uh, at the query level, but you can do it uh, at the network level. 
which is cool. So what did we learn? Um, yes, of course, that's, I'm a bit Captain Obvious here, but benchmarking can be challenging. It means you, can, you will have to spend a lot of time on it. It's really time consuming, but also it's rewarding. You learn a lot of things, like I did. Uh, take on performance benchmark does not favor non-blocking design because either in database tests, it's only up to 256 connections. And in plain text, it's 16K connections, but there is no backend. So reactive doesn't make, and non-blocking doesn't make much sense. As I said, there is a trade-off between usability and performance. And with Vertex, we try to be the most performance and get the best usability. And I think that's our sweet spot. Writing reactive applications can be sometimes challenging. And we try to provide the simplest and more effective way to do it. Uh, finally, pipelining makes a difference, and uh, that's what we saw, and protocols concurrency matters. Or that one is important, it means that when you test, when you benchmark distributed things, um, if you look only at the CPU locally of, at the things, you will not get the best out of it. You have to consider everything as a, as a system. And basically, my, my, my take on this is that today's database protocols for relational database have been written like 20 or 30 years ago, and they haven't been defined for today. It's like HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, and I believe that it would be good if, if vendors could upgrade their protocols so we don't need a connection pool, and with one connection, we can handle, we can multiplex several uh, re concurrent requests on the same connections. That would be a great thing, I think at least for uh, applications and scalability. Um, there are a few links um, in this uh, here, and uh, I've, I'm done, so I can take questions. questions? Hello, uh, nice talk. Uh, doesn't the, uh, to implement a client type too close to the one version of the database. So, for example, Postgres TLS is its own implementation. And if you implement a client directly to communicate, doesn't it get very coupled with the database version? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the question is, I think, uh, is, is the reactive Postgres client only too much coupled to, to, to Postgres? And, uh, well, if you, look at, if you look at the reactive Postgres client, yes, it's coupled to Postgres. However, today in Vertex, uh, in the next version of Vertex, we have started to, so I said the goal was to make something uh, not an abstraction. We have started to abstract uh, the reactive Postgres client to be a more generic client. And we are currently implementing protocols for MySQL and uh, SQL Server. So it's not the reactive Postgres client project. It's a, a fork of the project that we took at the Eclipse Foundation, which is the foundations where Vertex is, is uh, developed. And in this client, it will be part of Vertex 3.8 and also in Vertex 4. And it will handle MySQL and SQL Server as well. And, and we try to, to keep the same simple API, all the features and all the specific features to Postgre because Postgre has really great features like notifications. So you can send messages to Postgre. We'll try to keep them available and uh, get the best compromise we, we can have. There is one. Um, uh, my question is, are you uh, benchmarking different Java versions or even different Java um, implementations like GrabVM with BERTS? and seeing relevant differences. Uh, which version did you mention? If you know. are testing against different Java versions from Java 8, Java 9, Java uh, 11, and with different Java implementations from different vendors. We have actually, we haven't invested. Uh, we could do that. We haven't done it, I think. At some point, some we were running tests with Java 8, and some, at some point, somebody upgraded to Java 11, and it, it had more or less the same. So that's not something we investigated a lot. We could do it, and it would. I mean, it will be, again, more time to do it, but we, have, we haven't done it. Um, so usually we, usually we test, we do that with uh, OpenJDK 8 or OpenJDK 11, and 
it gives the results we have. And uh, there are plenty of things we haven't uh, considered, like uh, more uh, uh, JVM uh, switches. Or we haven't done also, we found that the out of the box garbage collection settings were working very well. And I think all the Java stuff in tech emperor they, they do the same and we haven't we haven't really tried we, we didn't try hard to to for instance tune the gc because we found it it works well okay i think that's the last question i see that the timer is uh, is is over um, thank you for coming it was a pleasure again for me to be here in barcelona